少，因灵寻，卡埃拉灵，阿萨卡哈拉灵，扎卡拉灵，少爱灵灵寻。Namaste. So, some time back, we published a video called the Matrika Prayer or Matrika Stuti. So, this Matrika Stuti is from the Tripura Rahasya, the secret of the goddess of the three worlds, and it's very, very deep. It contains multiple mysteries. So I didn't try to explain anything about it in the video itself. I was just reading directly from the scriptures. But I was very surprised that there were no intelligent inquiries into the meaning of the multiple mysteries given in this prayer. So, even though there's a lot that I could say about it, I mean really a lot. I compiled nearly a hundred pages of documentation, just trying to explain it to myself. <laughs> But given the the lack of interest, I mean, you know, from the very beginning of this channel, we've talked about terminology and language. Ontology, and how ontology really determines consciousness, because if you encounter a phenomenon that you don't have any word for, generally you can't be conscious of it. Why? Because you can't discriminate it from anything else. So, I was very surprised. When this Matrika prayer video introduced several very deep, obscure, esoteric terms, and nobody asked for a definition, so at that point I just went, oh, "These guys aren't serious," you know. <laughs> so, I mean, what can I do? You know, first of all, if you haven't watched that video, you know you should watch it now. Check out this link and follow it. Otherwise, everything I'm saying here is going to be meaningless to you. So this is the problem. In all these years of doing this channel, nobody has really understood or taken up. The practices. I mean, at least as far as I can tell, maybe somebody's doing it, hiding off in a corner someplace and not letting me know. But that seems weird too. So、uh, I find it very difficult to understand because when I looked at this prayer and. Came across the very mysterious sayings in it. I had to look everything up in the in the Sanskrit dictionary. I had to go into it and get to the bottom of it and find the meaning of it. And I was very glad I did. Because this prayer, if you understand it, reveals that the Sanskrit alphabet. Is not just a collection of letters. It's actually the story of creation, and the subtle sound vibrations that are used by the gods to create this universe. I just went, wow. Now, when we went through the Buddha's teaching of Paticca Samuppada. Tell you another topic that nobody has really understood, <laughs> even among Buddhists.、Uh, all the Buddhist teachers that I could find 
in Thailand and Sri Lanka, they all misunderstood it. So except for Jnanananda, Bhikkhu Jnanananda, and we've linked to his books and his teachings plenty of times in this uh, channel. So if you've been following this channel at all, or if you understand anything of what's going on here, you will have seen that and have access to his teaching. So I'm not going to go into that any further. But the question is, when we read in Paticca Samuppada that name and form gives rise to consciousness, you see, this is exactly what I was talking about, that ontology, our background knowledge of what can exist in the world and the terminology that describes it, creates our consciousness. And if we have a terminology, if we have a background theory of what exists in the universe, that determines our perception of that universe. Don't take my word for it. Look into it for yourself and figure it out. And you'll find, as I did, that most people miss, they, they have spiritual experiences all the time, like every day, but they miss, they don't recognize these spiritual experiences because they don't have the terminology. We've talked about misunderstood terms. Well, you can have a misunderstood experience too. And what happens when you don't have a term and you have an experience, but no language to describe it, is that you throw it in a mental garbage can. You ignore it. And this is called ignorance. You see? So because of ignorance, everybody is having spiritual experiences all the time. But they don't recognize them. So they don't make any advancement. But anyway, name and form. What is this name and form? Well, name is language. And form are the perceptions that we use to symbolize in language. So if I see this uh, tall thing with leaves on it and branches, I call it a tree. Huh? And so we all have terminology for the common things in ordinary life. Tree, house, car, man, sky, you know, and so on. But we don't have terminology, adequate terminology, for the things that really create the experience that we have. Our consciousness and how it comes into being. So when the Buddha says name and form creates consciousness, well, what is the origin of name? See, where does name come from? Where does language come from? What is the ultimate meaning of language? And then we find the Sanskrit language. The Sanskrit language is said to be eternal and that it manifests when the universe is created. Well, that sounds like a tall tale, doesn't it? But just consider this. The first two letters of the Sanskrit alphabet are A and A. Ah. And when a baby is born, what's the first thing he says? Ah! <laughs> what is this place? Huh? When the baby's happy, he goes, ah. And when he wants something, he goes, ah, maybe all night long. <laughs> ah, get me out of this. <laughs> so we can understand that the Sanskrit language is actually based on the reality of creation. And it is the process of creation. And it, it details how Sadashiva, or Brahman, becomes differentiated first into Shiva and Shakti, and then into the various other Shaktis, Ananda Shakti, Jnana Shakti, Kriya Shakti, and so on. And this is how the world is created. So we are trapped 
in the world. And liberation is the process of getting free from that trap. So to get free from the trap, to spring the trap, as it were, and get out, you have to know how the trap is constructed, how the world is created. What is its uh, foundation? It turns out the foundation is language, specifically the letters of the Sanskrit alphabet, which are called Devanagari. Devanagari means the city of the gods. There are 33 million demigods, according to the Vedas. And so their language is Sanskrit. And their, the alphabet is Devanagari. This is where the gods live because they have command of this Sanskrit language. They can create. They have all kinds of powers that us ordinary uh, beings don't have. Why? Because we never look into the foundation of language. So, okay, I have all this material that I researched on this topic, which is very deep, okay, and complicated because the world is complicated. Language is complicated because it's a trap. So I could do a very extensive series on this topic, but given the very kind of lackluster interest and lukewarm re response to these videos, I question whether it's worth the effort. So I was talking last night with Om Shiva, my friend in Germany. He's my oldest, I don't know what you call it, follower, student, friend, whatever. He's been following my work since more than 10 years maybe 12 years, I'm not quite sure. Anyway, we were talking about it and he was telling me, look, there are some people out there who really get it and really value this knowledge. And I'm going, eh, if there are, I don't know who they are. You know, they don't talk to me. So <laughs> as far as I know, uh, nobody's getting it. And uh, especially because I don't hear back from people speaking the language, the terminology of any of these great teachings. So I have found a section of the, the Sri Vidya, the Shaivite and Shaktya teaching that explains Buddha's cryptic reference to name and form. Now, this teaching was current in the same part of India where Buddha taught at the same time he taught. So it was probably part of the background of any of the educated brahmanas that Buddha uh, spoke with. So if Buddha said name and form, they would automatically associate it with this tantric teaching that was current in India at that place and time. Historically, it's a perfect match. So Buddha was not separate from the context in which he arose. And that context was the Shakya teaching. So this tantric teaching was spread everywhere in India, especially in Bengal and uh, that northeastern, whole northeastern part of India at that time. So everybody that Buddha met, at least the educated, intelligent, a class of people would immediately associate name and form with this teaching. And I finally penetrated to this teaching and found it and have it in uh, actually pretty good shape to present it and the practices that go along with it that allow you to realize it. But does anybody care? <laughs> you know, I've always been astounded actually, flabbergasted at the lack of intelligent response to these videos. So if, if you all take this seriously and you really want to know the amazing stuff that I've discovered, then you have to make some kind of response that motivates me 
by thinking, oh, there's somebody with a brain out there who actually cares about this stuff and is willing to commit to realizing and practicing it. So whether we continue this series or not depends on your response. Aung Tatsat. Aung Shakti Aung.